Coming up on the American Muscle Car, the amazing story of the Olds 442. General Motors has always made cars to suit everyone's tastes. If you wanted luxury, there was Cadillac and Buick. If you wanted good basic transportation, they offered you Chevrolet. And if you wanted high performance, pick a Pontiac. And if you wanted a good healthy dose of all three, you bought an Oldsmobile. When the first shots were being fired in the muscle car wars, Oldsmobile was the only General Motors division, other than Pontiac, that wasn't asleep at the switch. Olds built a car that had the image of the world's most exotic sports cars, yet was exactly what the new performance-minded youth market was asking for. This car embodied everything that Oldsmobile was about. High style, the ultimate in creature comforts, and neck-snapping performance. This car featured, among other things, four-barrel carburation, a four-speed transmission, and dual exhausts. It didn't have a name, just a number. They called it 442. What more could the drive-in crowd ask for? And oh yes, it just happened to launch like a rocket. The 442 Oldsmobile's luxury muscle machine. In the 50s and 60s, you might have thought America's space program was located not in Cape Canaveral, but in Lansing, Michigan. Oldsmobile's advertising made you think jet fighters were rolling off their assembly lines. The way their cars performed, this wasn't far from the truth. Oldsmobile's performance heritage dates back to the days when horses outnumbered cars on the nation's roads. Ever since Ransom Olds' Pirate, which achieved the breakneck speed of 60 miles per hour on Daytona Beach in 1904, Oldsmobile has always been at the top of American car performance. Olds leaped to the forefront of American performance in 1949 when they introduced their overhead valve 303 cubic inch V8. This engine made 135 real horsepower, and it was the first really modern V8 made in America. Rocket 88 soon became the cars to beat in stock car racing. Red Byron won the 1949 Daytona Beach race in an Olds and continued on to win the NASCAR championship that year. Bill Rexford won the national championship in 1950 in an Olds. Also in 1950, Oldsmobile won the Mexican Road Race, a grueling 2,000-mile event. For the next three years, Oldsmobiles won almost half the stock car races on NASCAR's schedule as they continued to develop their world-beating engine from 303 cubic inches to 324 cubic inches and 202 horsepower. By 1955, the other automakers had developed their own overhead valve V8s, which broke Oldsmobile's stranglehold on stock car racing. But it sent the Olds engineers back to the drawing board. In 1957, the J2 option came out with 370 cubic inches, 9.75 to 1 compression, and triple Rochester two-barrel carburetors. This boosted horsepower to 300, torque to 415 foot-pounds, and it put the Rocket Olds' back out front again. Oldsmobile knew that racing improved the breed. All the knowledge gained on the track went right into their cars. Thanks to their racing experience, when the muscle car wars began in 1964, they were ready. The owner of this 65 442 lives the legend every day, despite the fact the car was built a decade before he was born. We'll meet him when we return on the American Muscle Car. The stock car racing world went sailing along into 1958 with everyone loaded for bear. What a perfect time to throw a wrench into the whole thing. Or at least the Automobile Manufacturers Association thought so. GM's own president, Harlow Curtis, had three motivations to get out of racing in 1957. Number one, it was bad press. Number two, it was costing them a lot of money they could be putting into a product elsewhere. Number three, Ford was catching them. And nobody wanted to lay out that kind of bread to be second best. In 1959, Lee Petty managed to win the first Daytona 500 held on a big bank track, using parts bought from ex-Olds racers at bargain basement prices. It was the last win for Olds in NASCAR racing for a long time. The official decision, 
based on photos such as this, gave Lee Petty in number 42 the victory by a margin of less than one yard. Oldsmobiles wouldn't return to stock car racing for nearly 25 years. Somewhere in the Oldsmobile management ranks, someone must have breathed a sigh of relief. Now that all that racing hooliganism had been done away with, now maybe they could get down to the real business at hand, making and selling gentlemen's motor cars. Big, heavy, chrome, slow gentlemen's motor cars. Welcome to the age of the fins. There is an interesting side benefit to building luxury barges. It takes a lot of horsepower to pull 4,000 pounds of not very aerodynamic metal through the wind, and even more power to run all the accessories on the option list. So engine development at Oldsmobile kept right on going. It had to. Without more and more power, there was the danger that someone might mistake a 60 Olds for a condominium or a gymnasium. As the wretched excesses of the Fins era vanished, General Motors placed more emphasis on the new wave of compact cars. These cars weren't the favorites of car dealers, though. They were inexpensive, and they didn't have a lot of extra cost options to help the profit margin. But by golly, they had one big thing going for them. They were slow. These compacts were billed as the cars of the future by GM. Each took a different tack engineering-wise. Buick's little special offered a V6. Pontiac's Tempest came equipped with an automatic transaxle and a rope drive shaft. And Chevrolet went off the deep end completely with the Corvair. Oldsmobile reached out as far as they dared with their jet fire and came up with maybe the one innovation which had any performance potential at all, the all-aluminum V8 with a turbocharger. With the 63 Jetfire, Olds had achieved what all the other GM divisions had hoped for with their compacts, a sports car image. But in 1964, there was something blowing in the wind over Michigan's frozen tundra. It was called GTO. When I graduated from high school, that was the very first car I ever had, and I think uh, it's either midlife crisis or nostalgia, one of the two. I decided I wanted to get another one, so uh, I went in search and found this one. I, mostly, I think it's a desire that I have to kind of relive uh, some special moments in my life, so it kind of brings me uh, back to the mid-60s. I love sitting back in the seat in this car sunk down in with my head barely sticking up above the hood because they made all these cars with a dash way up here in the air just kind of peeking out over it and uh, I love it when you step on it and it kicks in and tears it. 